We're here in the Library of Congress with the Veterans History Project uh, interviewing Lieutenant General Julius Becton, U.S. Army, retired, someone who I had the good fortune of knowing back when we were in high school at Lower Marion outside Philadelphia. Uh, could you tell us a word or two about your background and early times back in Lower Marion where we both come from? Sure. Well, I, um, as you pointed out, we're, I'm from suburban Philadelphia, grew up in Bryn Mawr, which is not as rich as Narbeth, where you went to school, or where you lived, I think. But um, went to Lower Marion High School, got there in 1941, uh, graduated in 1944. But during that period, I had the ideal background growing up in a place that uh, was very affluent. My father was a janitor at an apartment, and so I lived on the side of the railroad where you have Bryn Mawr College, Harcum Junior College, Baldwin School, Shipley School, all of those are part of the elite of the main line. But uh, I went to Bryn Mawr Grammar School, and as you know, you cannot find a term grammar school in many places these days, and it was it taught, the, did the job of being, teaching grammar it, the best way they could. Well, now, tell me, uh, if you can, how you uh, happened to enlist in the Army and why the Air Corps and uh, so forth. I think that's an unusual story and sure. maybe you could recount it for us in your early days in the Army. Well, at Laura Marion, uh, I was a pre-med student. Uh, excuse me, I wanted to be a pre-med so I was a college prep student. Uh, I was also a member of the Civil Air Patrol because we could wear uniforms and that was pretty snappy for those of us coming along. And General Haps Arnold came out to our high school one day in 1943. You may recall he was a former graduate of Lower Marion High School, one of our famous graduates. And he gave us a long pitch about joining the Army Air Corps, winning your silver wings and gold bars. And with that, I and many of my football players, uh, fellow football players, went to, took the series of examinations. And six of us joined the Army Air Corps enlisted reserves in December of 1943. That was, I was a senior then, I graduated in June of 44, went on active duty in July of 44. Tell us a little about your experience of that and how you then got in, uh, into World War II. Well, uh, the war was going on at that time. And it was in 44 July when I went on active duty. There were six of us at the time. Five went to Florida for their pre-flight basic training. I went to Biloxi, Biloxi Mississippi as I many times said, a great place for a young black from suburban Philadelphia to go to, 18 years old. Uh, I said it with tongue in cheek. But I did not complete the program because I had astigmatism. Did not know that at the time. Well, I knew I had astigmatism, but I didn't, I thought I could get by the examination. Matter of fact, I had gotten through several examinations. Uh, one of the things which I used to get by the eye portion as you recall, they had charts in those days with great big E letter and then small letters and small letters. And then I was swift enough that I could take one glance at the chart and memorize it. And so when the examiner would ask you to cover your right eye and read, I had it done down perfect. One thing which I did not know, the new technology in 1944, they had a little machine. You go into a darkened room, you don't see anything, and then they cover your right eye and they punch a button and the chart reflected on the wall and I was caught. But anyhow, I failed the flight examination for high tests and did finish the basic training, was sent off to an aviation engineer battalion down in Biloxi, excuse me, in uh, MacDill Field, Florida. Uh, that is an interesting drill because well, it's an aviation engineer battalion. All they do is put down PSP, Pierce Steel Platform, for landing fields. 
and that is backbreaking work. So what, um, how did you, uh, how, what was your actual experience? What did you, how did you feel and how did you then get more closer to the actual war well, front? The, uh, one, I tried to find a way that I really wanted to get away from doing back-breaking work. I had a first sergeant, and by the way, this is an all-black unit. And my first sergeant was from the old school, been there a long time, but he was not that literate in reading. And one Friday afternoon, he came out to the formation and said, any of you boys type? I had typing as a club at Laura Marion. Put my hand up, come in here. Okay, I went in, and I, that weekend I worked as his clerk typing. Then he said, you're gonna be my clerk. And one of the things I had to do was to read the roster to him so that he could stand in front of formation and read the roster himself from memory because the words and so forth. And we did quite well. I became very important to him. It wasn't shortly, there, shortly after I had that job, uh, one of the lieutenants came in and said, First Sergeant, there's a test going to be given on the main base. You might want to send Beckton over there to go to OCS. First Sergeant said, Good idea. Beckton, you're going to go take that test. And so, yes, sir. I went over up here before the board. Another interesting fact, there were five people on the board. The senior member was a major who happened to have been, knew where Laura Marion was located. Now, Jim, you want to get a warm feeling. You're standing, <laughs> you're in a hot seat, being asked questions all the way down here in Florida, and for a guy to understand, he knows where you came from. That was very comforting. I passed the board uh, December of 44. I went off to Fort Benning, Georgia to attend OCS, Officer Candidate School. And because I did not have infantry basic training, we were sent to uh, Anniston, Alabama for training to get us used to infantry weapons and not the kind that the Air Force was using, the Army Air Corps was using. That was six weeks training back to Fort Benning in January and the Officer Kennedy School started for me. In August of 45, I graduated. Now I was 19 years old uh, at that time when I graduated and became a second lieutenant of infantry, 19, which is not the best thing for the Army, but you couldn't tell me that. So then, then what, was your, what was your subsequent service? Well, What's your commission? Keeping in mind that the bomb was dropped in August of 45, I graduated in August of 45. A lot of us had some hang up that we might not even be commissioned because the war is going to be over. And it was over. The treaty was signed in September of 45. I was sent off to a place called Moratai in the Pacific. Moratai is a series of islands north of New Guinea, south of the Philippines. Uh, I joined the 93rd Infantry Unit, Infantry Division, all black division except for the senior officers. And I became the youngest lieutenant in the regiment, 369th Infantry Regiment. I was in Charlie Company. And that's where I spent the remainder of the post-war period uh, up until a point that the division deactivated. But let me go back for, point out something else that happened to us. As the youngest lieutenant, I was selected, volunteered for all great jobs. Take that patrol up in the hill and see if you can find some Japanese. Sure. Where was this? This was Moratai. Okay. And the Japanese had been on the Yalan before. And yes, we found them because they shot at us. We came back and told our company commander, battalion commander, they said to work the regiment, that they're there. And his answer came back, I'm told, leave them there. We'll starve them out. Okay. At the same time, I was, again, being a junior officer, we had two divisions on the island of Moratai, the 93rd Division and the Dixie Division. Now, if you can think of any more non-compatible units to have in the 40s, those were the two. Dixie Division being all white with the title Dixie Division, 93rd being all black. I became an assistant MP officer 
riding in a jeep with an officer from, 90, from the Dixie Division. And our job was to ride around and throughout the area and make sure there were no inappropriate things taking place, no fights. The division deactivated in January of 46, and I was sent to the Philippines, to Manila as a signal officer. I joined the uh, 542nd Signal Construction Battalion, Signal Construction Company, and I became a signal officer. I spent from that time, January until November, uh, with that unit, and then was deactivated to came home. Just reviewing that uh, wartime service, your, your youth, there's these extraordinary juxtapositions that you were faced with within the Army, as well as uh, facing the prospect of, of uh, fighting the end game against an enemy. Uh, what were your feelings? What were, how, can you put yourself back in that, in that period, uh, just for a brief moment, about what your how, how did you feel about the war? What was your, what was your feeling about well, the experience? First, I was a volunteer. I was not drafted. I was a 19-year-old lieutenant, and I realized that lieutenants should be a lot older. I had high school education. All the other lieutenants had West Pointers or ROTC or college of some kind. So I felt that I always had to do something to prove myself, that I was capable of doing what was required. As far as the war is concerned, hey, in those days, we had uh, unconditional surrender, as I recall with the terms that were used, and we were out to do what had to be done. Well, then you were out of the Army for a brief time, but then came back in '48. so could you tell us a little bit about uh, uh, why you came back sure. and then into the Korean War, which broke out not that long after that? Sure. I, um, I went to Muhlenberg College on a football scholarship the first black student to go to Muhlenberg, and I won a football scholarship because my coach at Laura Marion had recommended me to the coach up at Muhlenberg. And I went up for a tryout. He was satisfied. I was accepted. Started school in February of 47. Pre-med student, football scholarship. And that football scholarship also afforded me, uh, I think, $40, $35 a month in addition to the, um, what was paid to the school, plus the GI Bill of Rights, so it didn't cost me anything. Uh, Pre-med student, worked very hard, but in the spring of 47, we had spring practice, and the, I injured myself, uh, separated shoulder, and I had a choice of going through medical treatment for my shoulder and dropping out of school, and I decided I really, football was not why I was there. I wanted to become a medical doctor. So I dropped the scholarship, uh, which meant I didn't get the $35, but they were doing pretty good for the GI Bill of Rights. In 48, I went to, I, I was still in the reserves at that time, and I went back to active duty for reserve training. In the 48, I was at Aberdeen Proving Ground for summer training, two weeks. It was that same time that President Truman issued the Executive Order 9981, in effect, desegregating the military, in theory. And since I really had enjoyed doing what I was doing in the Army, I was doing well in school, but I'd gotten married in January of 48, and we have later found out we were expecting our first child in December of 48, and the GI Bill of Rights, if you may have read about it, it was not all that plush in money, and I had to do something to take care of the family. We got together, wife and I decided to be recalled to active duty. I reported to Washington, volunteered to be recalled, and in November of 48, I was recalled to active duty, but assigned to Fort Bliss, Texas. Now, my wife is in Philadelphia, and we're going to have a baby in December. I went back to the Army and said, can I have some other place to go to sh closer? And they said, sure. They sent me to Fort Monmouth 
for 30 days while the, the child was born. And then I went back down to Fort Bliss, Texas. The Army, in theory, was starting to desegregate. That was not the case at Fort Bliss. I went to an all-black battalion. I stayed there for about six months. Uh, I volunteered to be a, a competitive tour officer. The Army was looking for regular Army officers, and those officers who were not regular Army, who were reservists or National Guard, had a chance to compete against each other to be selected to be regular Army officers. And I was one of those persons that was selected. There were 1,000 taken each year. I was sent to Fort Benning, Georgia for basic training again. I was then sent to Fort Lewis, Washington, where now time moved up to 49. And I spent time with the 2nd Division in Fort Lewis. Uh, the war, before the Korean War started, after World War II started, had finished. So what, uh, tell me about how you became involved in Korea and what your feelings were, uh, not only about, um, about that particular very unusual combat, uh, and a very unusual war <clears throat> uh, in terms of American history, but also about your feelings about the Army now that you were regular and also that the, the Army was in the process, at least ostensibly, of integrating. Uh, so how did that affect your feelings and what were your, what were your experiences there, if you could just talk about them during well, the Well, I was not a regular Army officer at the time. I was competing to become okay. a regular Army officer, and the unit had not desegregated. So uh -huh. in 49, I went to Fort Lewis, Washington, a second division. Uh, they had two black battalions at Fort Lewis, Washington, one artillery, one infantry. I was assigned to the infantry battalion, and the battalion commander, Hyman Y. Chase, black American, Ph.D., and we trained very hard uh, during, before the Korean War started. The Korean War came about on the 29th, 25th day of June, 1950. We were, the division was immediately alerted to go to Korea. I had been in my second phase of my one-year uh, competitive tour, where they take, as I said, a thousand officers throughout the Army, and there were six of us in our regiment, uh, all competing against not each other, but against some standard. Uh, I was a platoon leader in one company. At the, at the first quarter, we then transferred to another company. I'm in my second quarter when the war started, and we should transfer again to another unit, the third quarter. That would have caused me and the rest of us to be going to a new unit at the same time we're going off to fight a war. Uh, the six of us got to see the regimental commander say, sir, can we do better in this? And he agreed, don't make any transfers. So the unit in which I was trained with, I went off to Korea. I'll point out that the, regiment, that the battalion commander was changed a month before we took off. That bothered a lot of us because he had trained the battalion. He knew us. He was a black American. It was an all-black unit. And the person they could bring in was a white officer who had been in the battalion as a commander before. It so happened that the battalion commander had been on orders to be transferred to, of all places, Prairie View A&M College oh. in Texas. I say all thing. Can you recognize oh, what that you. is? Uh, and it turned out that uh, the Army, had, because they had already made the decision, they would not change it. And they weren't too concerned about the fact they were bringing in someone else. Uh, so on 15th of July of 1950, uh, my battalion shipped out, going to Korea. Interesting part of that, when the war started and we were alerted, we were short about uh, a third of our company. And that was true throughout the entire regiment. And by the time we got on board ship, we had all the numbers we needed. And who were those replacements? They were cooks, truck drivers, people that came out of stockade. And these were the folk they gave us to go and fight, uh, not infantry trained people. So while we're en route to Korea, we actually 
train as much as we could on ship. Physical fitness, yes. Rifleman marksmanship, we had orientation. They fired off the fan tail of a ship uh, with their M1s. And that's what we had. Uh, they weren't the best people to get, but they were people, their bodies. And so with that background, we arrived into Pohang, which was in the Pusan perimeter, the southern tip of Korea. Uh, the third week, latter part of the fourth week, uh, July 19 and 50. Because we were arriving with part of the division, our battalion was pulled out of the regiment and sent on a separate detail, which none of us could understand why. I later found out what the story was. But, and that story was, the, the folks at MacArthur headquarters weren't too sure about the effectiveness of this black battalion. And they wanted to put us out to a place where we could be tested uh, by providing airfield security and a few other things. Uh, we went on that mission, did well. The regiment caught hell. They took heavy fire. We were pulled back into the regiment, put into the line, and we were there when the efforts were to push out of the Pusan perimeter to take the offensive. And that was in September when we moved out, September 1950, uh, into actually engage in combat as part of the regiment. Um, my company, L Company, was, we had good officers. I was the youngest, as I said, in every place else. All the officers had been in World War II as combat. I had not been in combat in World War II. But when it came time for things to take place, my platoon was always the lead platoon. And why? Because I think, well, I know that the company commander felt that if he told me to do something, I would do it. His other company commander, his other lieutenants, he weren't too sure what they would do. They all were first lieutenants. And so that created a little problem, too. And the company commander was not a captain yet. I was leading a patrol in September of 1950. And I ended up by being trapped in a, between firefights of the North Koreans on one side. On our flank, another American unit who did not know who we were, so we could fire from them. And we could not get back into our lines because of it would expose us. So I was stuck with my unit out in a sort of no man's land. In, Lope, uh, uh, valley. Uh, this we were, is valley was. Did they, did they have the heights commanding, or where, the, were, uh, the, where was the shooting? Friendly going? units was on my right. Yeah. The enemy unit was in front of me, and we were trying to deal with that. Uh, we were effective and uh, continued the attack. We didn't have much choice. Uh, we were able to do what had to be done. We took fire ourselves. We killed some enemy. Uh, I sustained a, a shrapnel wound myself. And uh, we finally recovered, went back into our forces. And from then I went back into the medical chain. And how long were you were there? What happened subsequently? Well, after my first wound, went back into the medical chain of uh, Pohang, excuse me, Pusan, and then off to Japan, um, Tokyo, Yokohama, Sendai. These are places in Japan where Army hospitals were located. What was the wound? You were shrapnel. You shrapnel, said. right thigh, mm -hmm. and um, it was a clean wound. It did the uh, sort of cut out a little chunk and. And then, <clears throat> then what happened after this? Because of the wound, I was walking in a hospital. I was not bedridden. And the unit was doing very well, that is, the division and the entire U.S. forces, U.N. forces. And some of us wanted, hey, we heard that MacArthur said we were going to be home for Christmas. And we didn't want to be stuck in a hospital. So we volunteered. I volunteered to go back to the unit. Uh, 
that would put me back in a unit in in a chain going back in October of 1950. Uh, I went up through the replacement system and ended up in the same battalion and joint. Where were you then? Was, was we were, were that time the unit was north of the 38th parallel mm -hmm. and we were heading up into North, we were in North Korea. And you may recall from a history standpoint, there are people who had different views about what we should be doing this or yeah. not. What, what was the feeling in the, among the troops? Sir? Hey, Jim, I was a soldier. I was a lieutenant. <laughs> I, you know, they say go, I went. <laughs> uh, I knew where we were, but yeah. I wasn't concerned about the politics of it. Keep in mind, I'm also being, uh, also being evaluated for a regular Army commission. Oh. I was still on that competitive tour. Oh, you're tour. still? Oh, wow. It's, it lasts for one year. The year well, started in January, well, so... What I, more criteria? I had to have my wound. I had to. Uh, I was in good shape. I wanted to get back. When you got back to the same unit, how was the how was the morale? Actually, I went back to the battalion, but to a different company. I went to I Company. I had been in L Company. Okay. I went back as a platoon leader and also an exec officer, because I now was the except for the company commander, the senior lieutenant. Mm -hmm. uh, other guys have come in in the meantime, and we were on patrols. As I said, going into um, uh, North Korea. This is mountainous terrain. Now? Mountainous terrain, very mountainous yeah. terrain. Okay, uh, and it's cold. Uh, we had one interesting situation. I was in the lead again of my unit, going up into high ground, and we had an adjacent unit from a 25th Division, 24th Infantry Regiment, which is the only other black regiment in that area, adjacent to us. I point that out because it becomes rather important when I came up the, I went up the hill with my unit, uh, we got shot at, took fire, and I was told, come back down. So we came back down and but that time, the battalion commander was talking to the adjacent battalion commander com who was making a reconnaissance. And I reported to the battalion commander what, I, what happened. And this guy from the next battalion was saying from the 25th Division, I don't believe that, Lieutenant. There, there's no enemy up there. And I'm the guy who got shot at. Yeah. And my battalion commander said, OK, back then, go back up there. Went back up the hill. And I back down for an hour. This time I had a wound. I oh, had a, where was this wound? This was this wound was in the left ankle in the Achilles tendon area. It turned out to be a spent round that went between the bone and the tendon. Didn't touch either. And your knowledge of anatomy say that if either of those been nicked, I would be crippled. That did not happen. I came back down with the from the hill. That battalion commander was still there, and I made a very inappropriate remark to him. Are you happy now? Pointing out there is somebody up there shooting at us. And my battalion commander said, go take care of yourself, Becton. And he told this guy something else, I don't know what it was. And I went back into the medical chain. Uh, I would point out that I have never been as cold as I was that day, or during that period, up in North Korea. We were, uh, I guess, 20 miles from the river between China and North Korea. And when I got evacuated that day, the very next day the Chinese hit our unit. And there are many books written about it, River and the Gauntlet being one of them when the United States Army got kicked out of North Korea. I had been evacuated less than 24 hours before that. I had been flown back into Japan. My battalion that I was with lost most of, most of our officers. I think there are five that escaped. The rest were captured or killed. And we lost a large number of people, as did the regiment and as did the division. Uh, you asked me what I think about the war then, I wasn't 
all that happy. I knew damn well we weren't going to be home for Christmas. And so we were evacuated. I was evacuated back to Japan through the same chain I went through before. I got up to a place called Sendai. And when I went in, this time I was not walking. The nurse took one look. Not you again. I'm sorry, Lieutenant. I'm, this is me again. This time I spent in the hospital from November of 50 until February of 51. The war was progressing. We got kicked out of North Korea and we were dealing with the 38th parallel. Uh, the MacArthur had been replaced. We've gotten new commanders. And I will point out, none of those things are of interest to a lieutenant when you deal with who's commanding the major effort. Time moves on. Now, March, I was sent back to Korea. The unit was south of the 38th parallel. Now, was this the third unit then? Say again? This is, this is, what was this unit that you were attached with? Same you? division. Same division, okay. Same regiment, same battalion. Okay. And when I reported into the regimental adjutant, the person in charge of administration and personnel, oh, I'm glad to see you back. He's the same guy I'd known back in Fort Lewis. I said, we got a job for you. We're going to put you as an assistant S3, assistant operations officer, in the battalion because you had the experience that not many of those new guys had. And I was happy about that because this way I would not end up by being shot at again, not right away. Uh, as I'm making my way around the regimental headquarters, meeting people, there was a new regimental executive officer had been sent in from uh, MacArthur's headquarters. And it's rumored later that he was sent down to find out why the 9th Infantry sustained so many casualties during when they were kicked out of North Korea implying that because they were the integrated battalion with a lot of black soldiers, that was the problem, uh, which was nonsense, but somebody thought that. This new executive officer was named Lieutenant Colonel Olinto M. Barsani, and that's a name that become very important later on. Uh, the major skeleton, the adjutant said, sir, this is one of our old officers. He's been shot a couple of times. He, great combat record, and Barsani said, he goes down to L Company. But sir, we're going to put him back into operation. He goes to L Company, Major. Yes, sir. And I found out that L Company had lost all the officers, and when I reported in, uh, there were some NCOs in charge, and I took command of the company. Uh, we, and I stayed with that company until, as the company commander, for until I left, coming home. There was an interim period when they brought in some new replacements about April, and these were, had not been in Korea before, and one of them was a captain, and I was still a first lieutenant, so he took command of the company, but he basically said, you do what we have to do. Battalion commander told him the same thing. Uh, but I stayed with L Company until I returned home in June of 19, in May of 1951. My war was over, but uh, during that period, I was able to get a couple of Purple Hearts. I was awarded the Silver Star, uh, and I had combat infantryman badge, and I had got a great deal of experience. How would you humanly describe it as you left and came back, back to the states? Uh, what? Uh, what would? What were? What were your reflections on that well, experience? That's Pretty intense. You, as a historian, you know how the U.S. forces were treated when they got back from Korea. Uh, we weren't treated very kindly. And I, matter of fact, um, I had nothing un untold happen to me, but I didn't wear a uniform that much when I was coming home. Uh, we lived in, we had a home in Philadelphia. Uh, I was assigned to Fort Dix Training Center which is 30 odd miles from Philadelphia, so I was able to get home. I was happy about that. And I'd been in Fort Dix for about less than a month in a completely integrated unit. I was a training officer. 
And we got orders, I got orders to go to Camp Edwards, Massachusetts, which we, I found out was nothing but uh, the job I went to was a, to a battalion, all black battalion, and our job was to post police, clean up the post, provide a consolidated kitchen mess hall for all the people at the post, and do anything else that was, I say, degrading. An all black battalion, after I've been in combat, done pretty well, came from Fort Dix, which was an integrated unit, and put in this black unit uh, as basically a uh, excess lieutenant. I was in that unit for about less than a couple weeks. I went to Washington and I said, hey guys, I don't know how I did for my regular Army commission, but I was not interested at that time. I wanted to get out of where I was. And they sought up the situation, got it. And I was transferred to Indian Town Gap Military Reservation in Pennsylvania as a training officer. And that's where I spent the remainder of my time in the early 50s, I was, during that period, I ended up by commanding a training company, and we were training incoming re replacements. I was integrated into the regular army, uh, but been accepted through the competitive tour process. Not until Indian Town Gap, were, did, were you? Yep. So that was a little over the time limit, wasn't it? Well, it takes time for the oh, administration to work. Okay. You know, how fast is the administration and the Library of Congress? We won't go there. <laughs> but uh, those things did happen. I also had a chance to participate in a couple of schools. Uh, I got a chance to meet a lot of people. And in 1953, I was sent to Fort Benning, Georgia to go to the advanced course. This is where they take captains and majors and get you ready for command and higher things. Uh, that was a good course program which lasted for six months. And in 1954, I graduated, we graduated, and I went off to Germany. But during that period in 53, 54, um, we had our third daughter. Um, I forgot to mention that our second daughter was born when I was in Korea. And I met s some people who later had a, a lot to do with my life at Fort Benning. I was sent to Germany in 1954, April, joined the 2nd Armored Division in Mainz, Gonsenheim, Germany. I went in as a communication officer because while I had been at Indiantown Gap, I went to the communication course and picked up the skills of a, being a communication officer. I had that job at Mainz, Gonsenheim in Combat Command B for a year. I then took command of a company in the 42nd Armored Infantry Battalion. And this will be my third company if I, I commanded. And I commanded that company for a year. And then I was sent to the Combat Command Headquarters as an operations officer. So a year as a communication officer, a year as a company commander, a year as an operations officer. And I had a chance to meet a lot of very fine officers. And at that time, I convinced myself and my commander that I ought to become an armor officer and not infantry. Uh, they agreed, they rec recommended me, and I was transferred from infantry to armor. From the administration standpoint, or say typical guy on the street standpoint, it's no big deal, but it was for me. I just liked the way the armor operated in terms of concept of operations, in terms of what happened on the battlefield. It was in that position as the assistant operations officer at Combat Command Headquarters I was able to meet some people who later had a great deal to do with what happened to me. I stayed in Germany until 1957, and keep in mind, I still had not gotten that college degree. 
I was taking courses while I was in Germany, University of Maryland courses, and I was sent by the Army to go to Prairie View A&M College as an assistant professor of military science with the purpose of getting a degree. And you remember I said that would come back, yeah, Prairie yeah, View, yeah. and Hyman White Chase had been a professor of military science, but he was no longer there, but he left a legacy that uh, some people will never forget. I became an assistant, an assistant professor of military science at Prairie View in charge of MS3, that's the junior class of ROTC students. Um, the class, first group in the advanced course of ROTC, the second group being MS4. I was also taking classes, so I ended up by teaching some of my students. At the same time, I'm a classmate of some of them in certain classes. And I was in something the Army called final semester plan. When you have one semester left, the Army will put you on complete class, no work. And while I was at Prairie View, for three years, two and a half years, I was a professor, assistant professor of military science and a student. My last semester, I was there as a full-time student. And I graduated from Prairie View as with my BS in mathematics. My wife, Louise, had completed her baccalaureate degree for nursing because she had a regular registered nurse status before, and so she ended up by graduating a year before I did and became, in fact, the acting dean of the College of Nursing because the dean went off to get her PhD, and Louise, being a non-typical student, uh, much older than the students, was able to help. I was, got my degree in 1960, as we jokingly said. I graduated in 60, she graduated in 59. Obviously, she's older than I am. That didn't go well, but I, I said it. So, I finished Prairie View with my degree uh, in 60, went to France, and uh, wrong. I went to Command General Staff College in 1960 at Leavenworth, which is the place for the middle level officers, captains, majors, and lieutenant colonels. Spent a year there at the Command General Staff College, and then I went to France in 61. Well. Taking the story up uh, into the uh, mid-60s, uh, but in this uh, period, it seems to me you had a family, uh, Louise and the kids coming along. Um, so you were, you were having a variety of actual practical command experiences and at the same time um, additional schooling. Are there any is there, are there, does anything, I would judge from what you said, that maybe when you got into the armor side, that was a kind of a significant jump for you, or a significant, I mean, what, what in terms of your full later development do you look back on in that period as the kind of most decisive turning points for you personally in the Army, and also for the development of the Army as a better integrated okay. institution? While in France, I went to a logistical assignment, fourth logistical assignment, fourth logistical command. <clears throat> I'm now an armor officer, combat arms. I was trained at Fort Leavenworth in the Command General Staff College to be a, in a combat unit, making plans and operations and training, and now I'm stuck in a logistical assignment, which I really didn't appreciate. But I'm now a major, and I do what I'm told to do. The chief of staff of that unit was Joe Heiser, a colonel, later brigadier general, later lieutenant general, and became a personal friend in terms of helping me to overcome certain issues, problems, and he was a mentor of sort. While I was at logistical, logistical assignment, we stayed there until 1964. Actually, 63. I returned home in December of 63 and attended the Armed Forces Staff College at Norfolk, Virginia. This is a first combined with the other services, that is, Navy and Air Force, uh, majors and lieutenant colonels. That was a six month course. From there, 
I went to the Pentagon on assignment for the first time. During that interim period, I also went to jump school, parachute school. Now, I've been trying to become parachutist qualified from the time I was in officer candidate school. And I was denied for a variety of reasons. The first time, there was only one unit in the 40s that had black parachutists. And they were overstrength for officer personnel. And so when I applied for it, that was turned down. I applied again, and the, when I came back on active duty, and they didn't have any jump position for a signal officer because I came back as a signal corps officer. Now I'm leaving the Armed Forces Staff College, heading to the Pentagon, and I said, I want to go to jump school. Oh, you do? Sure you can go to jump school. You're going to go to personnel. You can do that now. So I end up by going to Fort Benning, Georgia, jump school for three weeks. We reported in on the 4th of July. Now, have you been in Georgia in in July, in uh, uniform, it's not very pleasant, but so be it. I got through jump school. And my dad, I was a student company commander because now I'm a major, I'm a senior officer, and, and that's an interesting situation too because the black hatters, that is the cadre, they want to make sure that they're in charge. And in jump school, for three weeks, you are under the thumb of a black hat, a drill sergeant, no matter what your rank may be. And when it came time to do them push-ups, they made sure I did them properly. When it came time to jump out of an aircraft, they made sure I did that properly. Uh, but it was good training for me. Got through that to include being in Georgia in July. Went to the Pentagon in personnel, uh, in the Office of uh, Chief of Staff of Personnel. And I went into an area of first dealing with the reserve components and later dealing with uh, enlisted assignments, or enlisted, enlisted promotions. Now a major is in 64, and then the president of, six, of uh, United States, Johnson, wanted to have one of his military assistants to be a black American. And a lot of people were competing for the job. I was asked, would I be interested? By all means, I was, sure, I'd like to do that. And my wife was not very happy about it, but she's a good supporter. And I was the Army's representative to become Johnson's military assistant. I was rejected because he later said that he wanted his Air Force II pilot, when he was the vice president, to be his senior military assistant. I had been promoted to lieutenant colonel when this came about, and his major, his uh, Air Force pilot was a major promotable, but on the list to be promoted, but I'm already senior. So that took care of my being selected. The Army said, okay, uh, we got another thing for you. Now, why did that take care of, care of you being selected? If you were higher ranked, you would think you'd be more qualified to claim it. But uh, the president of the United States said he oh, wanted to. Uh -huh. Any other questions, Doctor? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, I went off to another course. The Army, the Department of Defense, set up a course to train systems analysts. We had a person named McNamara who was providing the. Uh, guidance for the Department of Army, Department of Defense. And we had, you recall, something called whiz kids? Oh, yes. Okay, well, we need the defense, the military need to have people competitive with those whiz kids. Mm -hmm. And so there were 32 of us selected in the first class, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. We were sent to Ida, Institute for Defense Analysis, who won the contract to train this group of people. Now, where was that? This was... Right across the street from the Pentagon, okay, right, uh, right. 400 Army Navy Drive, paper clip building is the one nickname it has. Now, what was the attitude towards somebody with your degree of experience and professionalism in the Army suddenly seeing all these whiz kids moving in? I mean, was there a certain sense of uh, uh, competition there, or what was? Uh, can you can you reconstruct how you felt about that? And then well. How, um, 
keep in mind now this I just been turned down for being the military sent to the president. This yeah. is supposed to be a plus thing. And the Army is getting involved in something called operations research system analysis. And uh, I just finished my degree, which is in mathematics. And so I fit all the, the blocks because recent college work, uh, combat experience, uh, done fairly well, very well. And so I was selected as one of the six Army officers and for a class of some 32 people, mm -hmm. I might add, I was a senior army officer, therefore a senior army representative to the group. And that was probably the worst year of my life because we covered basically in that two and a half or six or 18 month period, a year of undergraduate, a year of four years of undergraduate math and one year graduate math in one semester, if you can believe that. We were being pounded with mathematical, et cetera. And I struggled through it, I got through it, but it was burning a lot of midnight oil. Um, the degree was granted by University of Maryland, and that was a MA in economics. Uh, later, Rensselaer provided a year, and the program rotated around some of the schools. I don't believe Princeton was part of that program. But I graduated in 66, was assigned to the Chief of Staff for the Army's office as a manpower analyst. I've gone from being a young personist, personalist, now manpower analyst with a degree in economics and a representative of the Army for Operational Research System Analysis. Uh, that's where I was when I got an offer to join a unit that's heading off to Vietnam. Now I've been trying to get assigned to Vietnam for some time, uh, but because of a series of schools that had to uh, fill certain boxes, I was not selected. I am now sitting in the Chief's office as an Operations Research Systems Analyst, and a call comes in from my branch, Armor Branch. Hey, Beckton, how would you like to join a unit that's heading off to Vietnam, airborne unit. Keep in mind, I'm also airborne qualified. And it turned out that the person they offered the job to first was in G3, or desk ops, in the Army. And he had completed about 30 months of his assignment. And because he had not completed 36 months, he did not have a full assignment as such, and his boss were not releasing. I'm sitting over in the chief's office with less than a year, and I was offered a job, and my boss said, sure, you can go if you get a replacement. And that was, could, couldn't ask for anything better than that. I was selected to go to command a armored cav squadron in the 101st Airborne Division. The division commander is the one who made the final decision. His name was O.M. Barsanti. Same name, oh. who had been the exec of a regiment that said, you're going to go command that company, and now accepted me as a commander for a very important assignment. I left the Pentagon in 1966, excuse me, 67, uh, joined the 101st Airborne Division, uh, took command of this CAV squadron. I became the first battalion commander equivalent black American to command a unit in the 101st. Uh, we're going to go off to war shortly in about six month period. We had a chance to select our officers, select our key NCOs, and train to go into battle. You can't go into battle much better prepared than that. Uh, we did those things. My wife family did not move to Campbell. They stayed in Washington and I was born geographical bachelor for all practical purposes. But when we were trained, we didn't have much time for family anyhow. It was there that um, I really had a chance to understand what Calvary was all about and what I had to do. Keep in mind, I had never been in a cavalry unit before. I had never been in an airborne unit before, except for five jumps qualified. And I had never been in an airborne division before. 
and I was selected to do those things, which raised a lot of questions. Why is this guy here? And so for, quite frankly, I was under the gun for about a couple of months to prove that I could do what had to be done. Anyhow, we deployed to Vietnam in December of 1967. Uh, we were there when Tet took place in 1968. We were very e effective in fighting the enemy where we were located. After Tet, we were deployed from the central part of Vietnam to North Korea, North Vietnam, to outside of Hue, the capital of the northern region. And I spent the remainder of my six months in command up in that area. The Army had a policy then that you could only command for a six-month period in combat. For some theory, you might be burned out, which I think is baloney, because you got soldiers there, and so why would I burn out more so than the soldiers? Anyhow, that was the policy of the Army, so I would move out of that squadron and sent back down to a place called Kuchi to become the executive officer for 3rd Brigade, 101st Division, which was back there as support of the 25th Division. I left, we left that unit, the 25th Division, and rejoined the division up north in what would have been September, excuse me, July of uh, 1968. And I spent the rest of my time in country, Vietnam, before rotating out in November up north. We had quite a few battles. We had, uh, during this period, I had one soldier who earned a Medal of Honor. Uh, we earned in the unit squadron uh, all the awards you could earn for a unit. We did it very, very well. And I'm very proud of that unit because that was 1967 when I left that unit, or 68 when I left that unit. And every two years since then, we've had a reunion. We just had a reunion last month of my unit from Vietnam. Well, now, could you uh, sort of explain what was unique about it from the point of view of somebody on the front lines fighting there, uh, as distinct, say, from Korea? beforehand, and, uh, <clears throat> and to what extent were you aware of all the turmoil that was going on at home about all this, and what was your feel sure. feeling about that? Obviously, much more senior as a lieutenant colonel than I was as a lieutenant, uh -huh. a lot more aware of what was going on at home. Uh, I was in command of the squadron when Martin Luther King was killed, and people were, were very concerned that we might have an uprising or something. Mm -hmm. And we had a memorial service in honor of him, and then we went back to work. We had no problems with that at all. Mm -hmm. uh, we had some humorous things that happened from a political standpoint. Um, about a month before I left my squadron, I had a reporter from Chicago sent to me by division. He wanted to find out how this black commander was doing, because I was still the only black commander, battalion commander in the division. And he wanted to find out what's going on. So he came in, uh, can I help you? Sure, I want to talk to your soldiers. Go talk to them. You gonna go with me? No, I'm not gonna go with you. You can provide somebody for me? No, unless you need some help. And so he spent about 12 hours with our unit. And then he went back to Saigon, or someplace, and would you believe I never heard another word about what he found out or what he was told. Nothing was printed about it. He, I found, I discovered, came in with an agenda. He wanted to prove that things were not going to work well in this organization. And that was not the case. We did well. Mm -hmm. uh, the other aspect, we were very effective in how we operated. I was the only armored unit in the division. And a very senior officer with the deputy commander of McV, uh, military headquarters in Saigon, Creighton Abrams, 
four star. When he would come out to the field, he used to visit us but once a week just to sit down and talk. He's an armor officer and I've got an armor unit. And if I had a godfather, he later became that godfather. Godfather in terms of making sure that certain things happen. Uh, but we did a good job and we were recognized for that job and we received a unit citation for what we did as combatant forces. What were your most memorable experiences in, in Vietnam and how do you look back on it now 40 years later? I had a maintenance warrant, an officer, warrant officer in charge of maintenance of our vehicles. Well, we didn't have a lot of vehicles because in an airborne unit you, we got jeeps and that's how we were fighting, not like it was tanks. And before we moved up north, he had approached me and said, uh, if I could, would he accept the fact that we could get some personnel carriers, armored personnel carriers, which were not authorized for the division because we're an airborne unit, they don't jump out planes very well. And I said, if you can do that without either of us going to jail, please do. All of a sudden, he went out and found six personnel carriers, armored personnel carriers. Five diesel, one gas. I later found out he went down to a local depot where the Arvin, the Vietnamese army was located, and they had a lot of equipment around. And he was able to talk them out of five of them, six of them. I think maybe a couple of scotches may have had made it work, but I didn't pursue that. Those personal carriers became our fighting force. It's something which the Vietnamese had not fought before, that is the North Vietnamese. Uh, we made sure they knew who we were. We painted the most ferocious looking eagle on the front of that personal carrier on each of them. We equipped them for combat, op combat operations, not just to carry people. We equipped them with machine guns on top, 50 calibers, and sides for firing 50 caliber weapons, and during that period, we never lost a personal carrier, even though they got shot at by a lot of people. They have RPG holes in them, but those guys were not going to let anything stop them, and they were very effective. I could not have been more proud of the unit, what they did, and the men that, who worked with them. I mentioned we had one Medal of Honor winner. We had a couple of Distinguished Service Cross winners, to include one of my company troop commanders. We had. Um, there are no parachute, no jumping during those, play, during those days, but uh, we had the spirit of CAV and the spirit of airborne. You combine those two things, you become almost untouchable. At least we thought we were anyhow. Um, and what about retrospective, looking back on it? What, what, what are there any sort of thoughts? You've had a lot of experiences since then as well. My experience in Vietnam qualified me for some very positive things. One, uh, I was selected to be promoted promote to colonel. Uh, two, uh, I was selected to go to the senior service college, in this case the National War College over at McNair. And three, the chief of staff selected me to become the military assistant to Nixon. Now, my second time to be selected for that position. And uh, I said, sir, if you tell me to do that, I'll do it. But if you ask me where I want to do it, I much rather go to senior service college, war college, because I'm getting further and further behind the age group that goes off to the war college. And General Palmer, Bruce Palmer, who was the acting chief of staff, said, right, forget about it. And so I, I escaped Nella opportunity to work at the White House, which again made my wife very happy. Um, I guess if I were able to just to put it into a nutshell, I did it as well as you could poss I possibly could do during that 13 months in combat with the 101st Airborne Division in order to get the things that happened to me later on. Um, <clears throat> so when you got back from Vietnam and did the War College, uh, what was uh, how did that experience differ from, apart from being at a somewhat more higher level and so forth? Well, the National War College is a, uh, 
I describe it this way. All war colleges are, are equal. Army, Navy, Air. You had the Industrial College of the Armed Forces and the National War College. But I would say all, all war colleges are equal except National is more equal than the rest of them. I say that because they have a record of having more ambassadors because we have State Department people, more admirals and more generals graduate from those who have gone to that school, that school than any other school. Uh, I was sent to the National War College. I left there and went as a brigade commander, now higher level, at uh, Fort Hood, Texas, 2nd Armored Division, same division I was in when I was in Germany, and now I'm br brigade commander. Matter of fact, the same unit I was in, same regiment or combat command. And we did very well at Fort Hood. At the end of my command tour, the Corps commander wanted to keep me on his staff to deal with what then was a bubbling up of unhappiness, racially speaking. Uh, you had a lot of unhappy soldiers coming back from the war who were draftees and wanted to get out. Uh, he wanted to use me in that position. I was happy about that because would the family have stayed there a little bit longer? And right before I was able to give up my command and go to that job, another call from Washington come in, Beckton, you're coming back to Washington. Why? One, because we said so, but two, we got a job for you. It turned out to be in charge of all armor officers, in charge of the assignment of all armor officers. As the chief of personnel, chief of armor, and officer personnel directorate. Now, that may not sound much, but remember, I'm not an armor graduate. I transferred to armor. I didn't have a lot of experience in armor as such. And now I'm going to be in charge of all the assignments. Now, some people took unhappiness. They were not very happy about that, to include a person who I ran across a couple of times, George Patton. Uh, he was now the assistant commandant at the armor school and uh, in charge of assignment or in charge of training, education of armor officers, lieutenant, captains, majors, and some lieutenant colonels. One of the things that we used to do as a branch chief would be to invite it to the school to talk to the officers. General Patton would not do that for me. He felt that it's a damn shame that my branch chief is not a graduate of armor. Mm -hmm. I said, sir, you can take care of that. Give me an honorary degree. <laughs> and he didn't take kindness to that. Anyhow, uh, George now moves on. And in comes Bo Williams, who is now the assistant commandant. I, in the meantime, get promoted to Brigadier General. I'm now sitting at Fort Dix. And Bo asked me would I come out and speak to the school, the students at Knox. Sure. Two conditions. One, I want an honorary, one condition, I want an honorary doctor, I mean, I want an honorary degree of completion of the course. You got it. He said, oh, by the way, we'll make you also an honorary faculty member, too. Super. I went out to Fort Knox, talked to the students, came back to Fort Dix, and I sent a fax to George Patton with the copy of the certificate, am I qualified now? Of course, he didn't answer that, but uh, I just felt I should do that. <laughs> Time moves on. Deputy Commander of Fort Dix. I met a lot of great people. I get promoted to two stars, Major General. And by that you expect I get another assignment. Post Commander is a Major General. So you got two Major Generals on a place where you only need one. And he was not very happy I'm still around. I've been there much longer than he had been there. And I later found out that I had been selected to command a division. First CAD division, Fort Hood, Texas. And the guy who made the selection, Abrams. I mentioned that he had been one of my mentors. But then he died in August of 74. And in come a new commander. I'm still at Fort Dix. I don't take command until December. And the... Uh, Chief of Staff made this new Chief of Staff said, well, if Abe said that Beckton gets command, Beckton gets the command. So I take off 
for Fort Hood in December of 1974, take command 1975. In the meantime, my raider, my boss at Fort Dix, was not very happy about my assignment, and he reflected that unhappiness in my re efficiency report. Of the 10 areas in which I was evaluated, from everything from public speaking, community activity, et cetera, et cetera, he said, I did all those things well except for training soldiers. I needed, didn't pay enough attention. Now, a division commander, that's the last thing you need to be told, you didn't train soldiers well. When that report got to Washington, I'm down at Fort Hood, already in command. The chief of staff comes down to Fort Hood, spent three days there. I did not know why, except two divisions there came to look at training. I found out from my boss down at Fort Hood that he came down for one reason, just to see how well Beckton was doing, because he would, he may have made a mistake by putting me in command when I had that kind of report card. He was happy what he saw. Uh, that re report never came up again, and I command the first cabinet division for 18 months. Uh, we did some pretty good things, a lot of fun, and I went from there to Washington again, commanded something called the Operations Test and Evaluation Agency. We are in charge of all testing of new equipment in the hands of soldiers before it becomes adopted. Uh, another fairly important activity. A Joe Heiser, name I mentioned again, was still around and he supported that move for me. I spent two years in Otia, which is out Bailey's Crossroad here in Washington, and was selected for a promotion to Lieutenant General. And now I'm going to command the biggest unit the Army has. In October, September of 78, I moved from Washington to Stuttgart, Germany as commander of the Seventh Corps. The largest corps the Army has, the most combat ready unit the Army had in charge of all of southern Germany. Who's my commander? Deputy Commander George Patton. I didn't mention the fact that when I was the commander of 1st Cav Division, George came in later as the commander of 2nd Armored Division, and we got along quite well. And then he went off to become Deputy Commander of 7th Corps, and I went to Otia. So now I'm coming in as the commander of 7th Corps, and George had every expectation that he would be the commander of the division, I mean, of the Corps. It turned out not to be the case, but he had expected that. But we got along quite well. When I reported in, in October of 78, General Patton came in and said, you know, we've had some difference of opinion, but I'll do whatever you want me to do. Thank you, George. Appreciate that. I just want you to do what you know what has to be done. Roger that, and we got along well. About a month later, he came in and said, you know, I'll try it, but I think that I'd like to get retransferred. Sure. I told my boss, George Blanchard, that Heidelberg, the use for a commander, United States Army Europe commander, that Patton want to leave. Sure, let him go. So he got orders to be assigned to Army Material Command here in Northern Virginia. Northern Virginia. Uh, he sent his family home right before Christmas, and he stayed on because we had a reforge exercise coming up in February. Reforger is acronym for Return of Forces to Germany which is the largest exercise that you can have in Europe at that time. It was the core exercise. I was in the exercise director and also in charge of the seven core troops. George was doing his thing as the deputy commander. At the end of that operation, George came back in and said, you know, I like the way you operate. I want to stay here. Fine. I called my boss, George Blanchard. George want to stay here. Hell no, he got to go home. Okay, General Patton went home, but during that period we were able to prove that we both were soldiers. And I will tell you that if I'm on a road to Moscow at that time, I had a couple of folks who were really, could create problems from other people's standpoint. My regimental commander, cavalry regimental commander, covering force, a Major General Bob Wagner, then Colonel Bob Wagner, and George Patton, my deputy. If I'm on the road to Moscow, I want those two guys with me because they were that good. But uh, 
turned out we didn't have to go to Moscow and they couldn't beat her anyhow. So, Lieutenant General in 7th Corps, first black American to be a lieutenant, to be a Corps commander, had largest forces of anyone. Um, the Chancellor of Germany, I'm later told, was not very happy about a black American coming in in charge of such a large piece of the real estate. Uh, I'd been there probably less than three or four months and I got word that he couldn't be happier in that short period through his spies, whatever you want to call them. The mayor of Stuttgart, Oberberger, Oberbürgermeister, uh, okay. Well, now tell me just uh, quickly on the, on this last period. How the whole Rommel. 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 Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's the first mental blank I had in during this period. By the <laughs> way, I'm older than he is. I'm 84, so I have an excuse for having. <laughs> <clears throat> now, what? Um, w this was the Cold War period still. It's Cold War period. Pretty strong. Very uh, strong. Pretty strong. So how did, uh, you're, and you're at a much higher level of command now, really, yep. and, and, but at the same time on the front lines, not just uh, uh, yep. preparing for things. You're, there, there was always the constant possibilities there. How did, how did your feelings um, about the Cold War differ from your feelings about the three hot wars that you were in? Okay. And then I have one more question beyond that, but go ahead. Let me one. pick up one second when I had that mental blank, because it's important that Rommel, mm -hmm. who was the Ober Oberbürgermeister, upper mayor, yeah. had a great relationship with the Army, with us, mm -hmm. and we became very close personal friends. Even to this date, he's now suffering from quite a few things happening to him, uh, Parkinson being one of them but we still exchange Christmas cards mm -hmm. and letters. And you may remember at a birthday party, there was a videotape made and uh, he had participated in that videotape. Yep. Uh, by the way, the person who produced that tape was a patent, the junior, the youngest member of the family. Yes. I won't even mention those things in passing. Wow. Wow. But okay, how did the Cold War differ from the, the other hot wars? We had first to take care of our own real estate. We were basically uh, operating in the mud. Our motor pools were not cement, not prepared well, and we had to overcome that. The administration that took the change in the, at the innovative brought in, in the 1980, in the 19... Uh, You know, 1980, brought in money, and we got a lot of money to refurbish what we're doing. We also had a lot of time to train our soldiers to go out in the field, and we trained very hard. I had a great Air Force counterpart because the Army and Air Force had to work together. The commander of my counterpart was a Lieutenant General Earl Brown. I say that because here we have a situation in Europe where the major ground commander is a black American. His counterpart, Air Force, is a black American. When we went to the field, he brought his headquarters out to the field too, which is, was not expected, but he wanted to make sure that we were able to get things done if we had to. And we, our staff got along very, very well. And I'm only mentioning this being black American for another reason. I've been in command for about 10 months and my staff judge advocate came in to see me, my uh, secretary general staff came in to see me one day and said, sir, I think you're gonna like what I'm gonna tell you. What's that? You're no longer a black corps commander. What do you mean I'm no longer a black corps commander? Look at me. He said, no, no. The public affairs officer brought in a piece of paper and showed me that for the last nine months, whenever the German paper press wrote about you, they had a black corps commander. Now they just said a corps commander. My point, minor point, but a very significant point. I go back to my comment about the chancellor being concerned about the community, being concerned about the relationship with Rommel, 
uh, we were able to do the kinds of things that I felt were very important. We also, on the this staff side, the family side, uh, we took the lead and deal with our women, uh, be they soldiers, family members, employees, whatever. And note, I did not use the term dependent, I said the family members, because we were the ones that started getting a change of terminology from being dependent to being a family member. That may not mean much to many folk here, but for, like my wife said, I'm not dependent on you, I understand that. I'm a family member, got it. And so we started. And as Bob will tell you, that term is used throughout the military now, except for in law where the, the code talks about dependent, that must stay, but everything else is family member. Uh, we did some great things. That program about family symposia got to start back here after we did it in the Seventh Corps. Uh, I had some outstanding soldiers. At least six of my colonels then ended up by being four-star generals. So that tells you, give you an idea what kind of talent we had. Uh, felt very good about what we did. Uh, we were prepared to go to war if we had to. And we wanted to make sure the Germans knew we were prepared to go to war. Uh, they did. Tell me about your retirement and how you look back on this remarkable career in the Army and the impact for you and for America. I retired in August of 1983. I was the Deputy Commander of Training and Doctrine Command. That is in charge of all training, officer enlisted, all doctrine, concept. It's a large share of the armies pre getting prepared to go to war. I was also the Army Inspector of Training. The Army had an Inspector of Training in 1776. And the Chief of Staff thought Shy Meyer, we ought to do something like that. So he appointed me as dual headed deputy commander and the Army Inspector of Training, which gave me an opportunity to actually be an evaluator of everything in the Army to include evaluating myself, how well we were doing in training. And so we did that too. Um, but during that period, I got a chance to meet a lot of people uh, that were very important to us later on. Near my retirement date, I had decided I did not want a retirement parade. Uh, I've seen too many of those, and I just felt I didn't want to go through that. And I let it be known, which made my staff very unhappy. Uh, it made the trade out commander, training doctor command commander, unhappy too. And I was convinced that the retirement was not for me, but for all the soldiers who I had worked with that may want to participate, etc. Okay, fine. And I said, okay, there'll be no tear jerking presentations to my staff. Got it. Well, along come my retirement date, 23rd of August, 1983. I'm out there, I give a great speech, so I say. But in the audience, we had 30 odd general officers who had traveled into for the retirement parade. And as my memory, if not faulty, we had every black general officer except one traveled there. It was in the audience. Uh, Major Colin Powell was sitting in the second row. I felt very, very good about that kind of support. The other thing which my staff did to me, which I was not prepared for, as we're lining up to have the trooping of the line, that is soldiers marching by, uh, band playing, at Fort Monroe there's a disable at the parade ground. And after the band had passed and they, the band was playing the songs of retirees. There were four retirees, by the way. I 
said, if I'm going to retire, I want a normal retirement. So they had four generals, four colonels, excuse me, one general, other general, two colonels. And each of us had our selected song. And after that was done, it was announced that one other thing, please focus on the gazebo. And from behind the gazebo came a series of soldiers carrying the colors of the unit that I had served with. Starting with the flagpole L Company, uh, 9th Infantry, 2nd Infantry Division. We had my squadron colors, 2nd and 17th Cavalry, Combat Command colors, we had soldiers from Fort Hood carrying the first cab colors with the typical attire, including the Black Stetson. And we had troopers from 7th Corps. Now, even when I think about that, I get emotional because it, it was just, when you think about that, that there is your entire Army story right in front of you. And they all came up one line, stood, and saluted. And uh, I see you get emotional when you think about that. I got emotional then. Uh, so did Louise. Uh, we were both standing out there. That gave a pretty good indication of what some people thought. Okay, time moves on. Um, I had four jobs after leaving the Army. Uh, interesting enough, the first two, I was working for the government as the Director of Foreign Disaster Assistance and Agency for International Development. And because I was working for the government, I was on a dual compensation. You may remember at one time you could not draw retired pay and also government pay at the same time. So for that period, I worked basically with no increase in pay. The, but I wanted the job. I wanted to do the job. And you heard why I went to the first job. I won't repeat that. but. Uh, you remember I, I was trying to help my wife, I reorganized the kitchen, I said I won't do that, I went to work. So from Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, Director of FEMA for three years, Prairie View A&M University as the President for five years, and the last job I had, as I've said many times, the most difficult job in my life. Superintendent of the District of Columbia Public Schools. Why was it difficult? Because in this city, uh, no good deed goes unpunished. And you have people who think they're in charge, and they've had more superintendents in the District of Columbia than any other urban area that I know of. As a matter of fact, as you may know, just recently the last superintendent, Michelle Reed, just left. It's a uh, very challenging position. And I didn't have a problem with the unions, but I had a problem with a judge. And I would just recommend anybody want a real story, read my autobiography. I can put that in, can I? Anyhow, read the autobiography. It tells a story there. But those were the four jobs I had. Uh, I think what I did in the Army prepared me for those kinds of jobs because not to teach me to lead soldiers in combat, but teach me how to be a manager, how to deal with people. Yeah, those were the things which, if I had to pride myself of anything, I think that's it. I understand how to get along with people. I even had a chance during that period to, I was asked by the librarian of Congress, would I like to come over here and do something over here? And I think I told him no. Uh, well, I was able to help him select his deputy. I guess a retrospective question about uh, your really unique pathfinding career is something of great pride to the old school and to any, anybody who's known you at any stage along in your remarkable career. What do you, what is it, uh, what broader points could you make about uh, leadership? Uh, you've obviously had that capacity in a variety of different ways, both in the Army and then later uh, in civilian life. Um, what, what are the lessons that you've learned about leadership and about uh, the development of America 
I mean, the Army the military forces in many ways ahead of the country as a whole because people have a clear set of objectives and a clear structure of how you measure accomplishment and things of that kind. What, what broader lessons do, does America need to learn when you have a situation now where so many people in leadership have had no experience with the military experience at all? Uh, so what broader lessons for our society would you, would yeah. you draw from, from that experience? Uh, Jim, over the period of wearing a uniform, I developed a, a certain philosophy of command. And there were 12 points that I use. Uh, be professional. Integrity is non-negotiable. Uh, Chain of command works if you use it. Innovate, seek a better way. Admit mistakes. Four things. Uh, first, conservation is everybody's business. Then I added to that, conservation and security is everybody's business. I, I ended up with conservation, security, education, and one of which passed right now is everybody's business. Uh, disagreement and not disrespect. Be sensitive to and intolerant of abuse and misuse of your people. Chain of command works, excuse me, I've had that, but um, admit, keep things in perspective and maintain a sense of humor, those 12. And I have used them every place I've gone, whether I'm talking to soldiers, while well, I'm talking to the people in the building, Pentagon, where well, I've used them at commencements, because I think you can change them around, rephrase them any way you want, but to me it helps. If I were a new person coming in and my boss told me this is what he believes, that tells me what I, can, what I have to do. Too many of us go to work for people and we never know what the boss expects other than just do the job that you're required to do. But what does he expect of you as an individual, as a human being? Mm -hmm. And I'm able to use that and very effectively, I think. Um, it has been very helpful to me in all five jobs, Army and the jobs I've had since the Army. Uh, I've been lucky enough to get, fourth enough to get five honorary degrees, doctorates, and with what some of the things I've done are reflected in what they stated I did. Uh, I have a, an appreciation for people, which I think is very important. Uh, if I had to pick the most important of those 12 items, I would pick the second one, integrity. It's non-negotiable because nothing more important to me, I think, to anyone else than their integrity because once you lose it, you're in trouble. And I added a 13th one uh, when I went to the District of Columbia Public Schools, uh, children first. And uh, I've, that's my bread and butter. That, that, uh, my kids use it. Uh, our Air Force colonel, daughter, who's retired, used it in her job. Uh, even my wife used a couple of those points uh, because we all help to make that happen, and we all work to make it appropriate. Well, Julius, I just have to say in conclusion that uh, on every front, as a military commander, as a leader, as an inspiring of other people who have been called on to lead in various ways, as a family man, as an American, you're a kind of hero. And uh, um, I hope you know it, and I think the secret to it all is how you relate to people. Could you say just the last word about that? Because that really is something magic that has earned you the admiration, the affection, and the appreciation of more people than have ever said thank you to you, even people you've just touched slightly. So I know it's embarrassing to have to talk about yourself, but how is it that you, you have got this 
special magic with people as well as a sense of command? Well, because you've got to deal with people. And as simple as that. You know, this fellow sitting over here, I never knew who Bob Patrick was until he was in the Army, I didn't know. But I went to work for the American Battle Monument Commission. And we were the ones that were in charge when the World War II Memorial was built. And he was intimately involved. And you didn't know who Bob Patrick was back when that was being put up. I don't think you did. No. But um, I mentioned it to a fellow named Don Scott, and Don Scott said, you need a person, and so he's here. Um, I've had the, we had a person, P.X. Kelly was in here. Uh, we had lunch together. Oh, yeah. Uh, P.X. Commandant of the Marine Corps. Why would a soldier meet a Commandant of the Marine Corps? Well, we were on a couple of boards together, and then we got to be, to know each other quite well, and are friends to this day. Um, and I'm, I'm fortunate enough to meet people, I am fortunate enough to meet people like that, and recognize that, hey, we can help each other. Uh, I've worked with four Commandant of the Marine Corps, and, uh, because of jobs, because of boards, number one, and because we're talking about people. And as long as we deal with each other as people, I think we, we can make things happen. When I put that one in about admit mistakes, if you think back to some of our previous administrations, uh, they were accused of not admitting a mistake was made. And when you stand up in front of a group of people and say, hey, one of our problems is we don't admit mistakes, right? I think I can sit it. I, it's my philosophy. And if someone wants to take it personally, that's their problem, not mine. Uh, I feel so that uh, if I can look myself in the mirror in the morning when I shave and uh, recognize that, hey, you got some shortcomings, you got some things that work pretty well, but as long as I feel pretty good that I can do, look at him in the morning or go to bed at night, I'm not going to stay awake twisting and turning because of something I've done ill to persons. I just try not to do that. And I got five great kids and a superb wife of 62 years, I might add. So we're talking about uh, the uh, family. 11 grandchildren and three great grandchildren. And uh, on a great grandchild stand, I have a great grandson who's taller than you. He's six foot eight. So, uh, and he's 21. And yes, he plays basketball. So we cover the spectrum. Thank you, General Hector. Thank you, Dr. Billington. <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.